In this final section of the chapter one material, we'll discuss the primary goal of businesses and the types of businesses that exist outside of the United States. There are a lot of potential goals of a corporation. A corporation could focus on maximizing profit, minimizing costs, increasing its market share, or supporting social causes. However, because a C corporation is owned entirely by shareholders, the goal of this firm should be to maximize the value of the firm to the shareholders. This means that a CEO should always focus on actions that increase the market value of the firm's shares. The market value of the firm's shares is the price that the shareholders could sell their shares for today. It's different than the book value of equity listed on the balance sheet. The market value of a share of publicly traded stock is the price per share listed on a stock exchange. The reason management's goal should always be to maximize shareholder value, i.e., i.e., market value of the firm's equity, is because each of the other potential goals I listed earlier must often be considered when the CEO makes their decisions. For example, a CEO could focus on minimizing costs in order to increase the profitability and future dividends shareholders receive, but minimizing costs could damage the long-run viability of the firm because the firm is not investing enough in research and development. As we'll talk about later in this course, the value of a share of stock is based upon the discounted future cash flows the owner of that stock can receive. This means that the goal of a CEO or financial manager should be to increase the future cash flows of the firm that accrue to the shareholder or shareholders if they want to increase the market value of the stock. Some firms have secondary goals. For example, when Ben and Jerry's was first started, the owners, obviously Ben and Jerry, wanted to also benefit their local community and use socially responsible ingredients. The problem with goals other than shareholder value maximization is that often there are shareholders who don't believe in the secondary goals or are only interested in earning a high return on their investment. There's also the issue that a firm is competing with other firms whose sole focus is likely value maximization. If one firm is socially responsible but inefficient, while their direct competitors are not socially responsible and therefore potentially more efficient, the competitors could drive our socially responsible firm out of business. This is one reason why firms should always be wary and try to maximize shareholder value. So you might be wondering how we actually determine the value of a share of stock. We determine how valuable a share of stock is by calculating the present value of all of the future cash flows you're expected to receive by owning that share of stock. We do this using the model that you see, this intrinsic price model. This model is a basic variation of the time value of money formula, the most important formula in the field of finance. To value a share of stock, we estimate the cash flows we'll receive at each point in the future. Then, we discount each cash flow back to the present to account for the fact that we're unable to invest the money we spent on this share of stock for a certain amount of time. The amount we discount our cash flows by is called our discount rate. In this case, our discount rate is an interest rate. You can think of a discount rate or interest rate as the compensation for you giving up the ability to use your money for a certain amount of time. We sum all of the discounted cash flows up to calculate the intrinsic price of a share of stock. This intrinsic price is the price that shares should be worth based on all expected future cash flows of the firm. If the current market price of this stock is higher than the intrinsic price we calculate, we might want to buy this share of stock. Now, there are a lot of factors that affect future cash flows. For example, lawsuits against our firm might lead to a decrease in future profits and cash flows of the firm. This is one reason why management usually act in accordance with the law. Decreased future sales might also decrease future cash flows and thus decrease the intrinsic price per share of the firm. Using this model, we can also see that when a firm gives cash to charity, 
it will have less cash to pay out to shareholders, which decreases the value of the firm's shares. In the denominator, an increase in the rate at which we discount cash flows will decrease the value of the firm's shares. There are lots of factors that could increase our discount or interest rate. For example, if the firm we've invested in is close to bankruptcy, banks might only lend to the firm in exchange for a very high interest rate. Using this model, hopefully you can see why we care so much about the future cash flows in finance. Expected future cash flows determine the underlying value of every asset in finance. Now, let's take a look at an interesting problem. Let's say you used to manage a company you own, and let's call it a scotch distillery. On December 31st of 2014, the company was worth $1 million. You decided to step away and travel, so you hired a manager who likes to take long vacations and neglect their responsibilities. A year later, the company is only worth $750,000. What kind of problem are you facing? Well, since I've put the answer on the slide, this is probably not a difficult problem. In this example, you're facing what's called an agency problem. An agency problem, or as it's sometimes also known, an agency conflict, occurs when the interests of a principal, in this case you as the owner of the distillery, and an agent, in this case your manager, are not aligned. Although you're paying the manager to operate the distillery, that manager might derive benefit or value or utility, in other words, from being lazy. You know, they, they don't have to work as hard. If you haven't properly incentivized your manager to maximize the value of your firm, then more often than not, your manager will act in their own self-interest and enjoy themselves. And so this is one of the biggest problems that we have with the corporate form, or the, C, the C Corp or the S Corp. The managers that run the corporation are often not the, the primary shareholders. They might not most of their value is not tied up in their the shares that they own. You can have agency problems in many situations outside of business. The classic example we use in business is the agency relationship between shareholders and the CEO or between board members and the CEO, since board members actually hire the CEO. In any agency relationship, a principal hires an agent to represent their interests. However, agents tend to act in their own best interest rather than in the best interests of the principal. The cost the principal suffers when an agent doesn't maximize the principal's value is called an agency cost. An agency cost is often not directly observable, so we often say that it's an opportunity cost or the cost of a missed opportunity. In the example I just gave, the agency cost is the difference between what the firm is worth now, aka $750,000, and the value it could have been worth if it was properly managed. There are many classic ways to reduce but not completely eliminate agency costs. The board of a firm can incentivize management to maximize firm value using stock options or bonuses that are tied directly to profits. Both of these, however, can have unintended results if the manager games the system for their own advantage. Another method for reducing agency costs exists in the corporate control market. Stockholders technically have control of their firm, and if they're dissatisfied, they can oust management via what's called a proxy fight or a takeover. A hostile takeover occurs when an outside investor, so an investor that doesn't own a majority of the shares, lobbies the shareholders, the, the other shareholders of a publicly traded firm to sell their shares at a premium. Once the hostile investor buys enough shares, they can replace board members and force the board and management to agree to sell the remaining shares of equity. However, this is much easier said than done. Staggered elections for board members can often make it difficult to replace existing board members. Poison pills and other anti-takeover mechanisms often make hostile takeovers difficult to accomplish. Uh, they might require a supermajority for any, any change to the corporate charter to pass. Occasionally, a hostile takeover occurs when uh, a firm has very ineffective management, but these, 
these hostile takeovers, these methods for reducing agency costs in the corporate control market, they're extremely rare. Uh, they're much less common now than they were in the 1980s. Now, one of the primary roles of the board of directors of a corporation is to oversee hire and fire management when needed. If a manager is performing poorly, the board can threaten to fire or actually fire and replace the management. One other method for reducing agency costs is to take cash out of the hands of management. There are many firms in existence today that have a large amount of cash on the balance sheet. For example, Apple, Google, and Berkshire Hathaway each have tens of billions of dollars just sitting in cash. Unethical management could use this cash for their own benefit or for selfish reasons like buying a corporate jet that only they get to use or acquiring a prestigious but overpriced asset or corporation or simply increasing compensation to their loyal subordinates regardless of those subordinates' performance. The boards of many firms institute dividends to take cash out of the hands of management and return it to shareholders in order to reduce these kinds of practices. Uh, so this is why Apple, Ford, this is why many of those big firms, those big blue chip firms that you've probably heard of, pay dividends. Now, there are other tools that the board can use, such as requesting that management lever up or borrow more money. Uh, the reason that management might ask a firm to lever up is because the interest payments to the bank or whoever lent the firm money will decrease the amount of cash on hand available to management. In addition to management being lazy or taking pecuniary benefits for themselves, there are some cases of fraud by management and board members. Back in the late 1990s and early 2000s, there were many accounting scandals driven by corporate greed. One of the most famous corporate scandals was that of Enron. Enron began as a natural gas company, and over the next several decades, it began to acquire other competitors and grew into a multi-billion dollar firm that transported natural gas through pipelines in the southern United States. In 1985, a man named Ken Lay became the firm's CEO. He changed the firm's name from HNG Inner North to Enron. His tenure as CEO also coincided with several changes in the natural gas business that allowed what's called mark-to-market -market accounting. Over the next several years, Enron changed its core strategy from transporting and selling natural gas to using the firm's insight in the pipeline business to make large amounts of money in the futures market, since Enron had profitable information about the supply and demand of natural gas. Enron began using mark-to-market -market accounting of futures contracts, which meant that the value of the contracts were recorded at the replacement costs. During the 1990s, Enron also began to use off-balance sheet partnerships in order to hide the debt the firm had borrowed in order to finance its operations. The firm also began to diversify into other industries and countries where it didn't possess a competitive advantage. So, in other words, Enron began to get away from its, its core business, which should have been transporting natural gas. Now, Enron's fall came in the early 2000s as investors began to question the accuracy and legality of the firm's financial statements. Much of Enron's debt was not recorded on its balance sheet, and much of its profit and assets were, as we say, fictitious. Amazingly, Enron's senior management claimed to have no knowledge of any misdeeds. As a result of the scandal, Jeffrey Skilling and Andrew Fastow, Enron's COO and CFO, received a total of eight years in prison. Ken Lay, the CEO, died before he could be sentenced. Both Enron and the firm's external auditor, Arthur Anderson, filed for bankruptcy. Now, this is one event in corporate history, but the larger fallout from this scandal came in the form of new legislation called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, or SOX for short. Now, SOX implemented new accounting practices. For example, now 
both the CEO and CFO of a public firm have to sign off on the firm's financial statements before they're submitted to the IRS. This new regime is viewed as costly for firms, which has led many firms to go dark, or in other words, become private firms when they were already publicly traded. The management of Enron lacked business ethics, which in general refers to a, a form of professional ethics that governs how an individual addresses moral or ethical problems in a business environment. However, Enron was not the only case where management lacked business ethics. There are many firms in existence today that lack business ethics. For example, stockbrokers historically have been known to convince their clients to buy and sell shares when it was not in their clients' best interests in order to increase the broker's commission. They get paid based on how many shares their, their clients buy or sell. Now, there are several pieces of legislation that attempt to reduce violations of business ethics. One that I should mention, since it's still being hotly debated today, is what's called the Volcker Rule, which was initially included in the Dodd-Frank Act, which we'll talk about later in this course. The Volcker Rule is a federal regulation that prohibits banks from conducting certain investment activities with their own accounts. It limits their ownership of and the relationship to hedge funds and private equity funds. The Volcker Rule's purpose is to prevent banks from making certain types of speculative investments that contributed to the 2008 financial crisis. While financial professionals only need to follow the letter of the law in order to remain out of jail, there are, however, several professional organizations, such as the CFA Institute, that mandate that their members act according to that group's ethical standards or risk losing their certification. Now, the final topic I want to mention with respect to ethics is corporate governance. And corporate governance refers to the mechanisms, processes, and relations by which corporations are controlled or directed. Firms with good corporate governance are able to effectively incentivize management to act in the best interest of the shareholders. In fact, financial research has shown a strong positive relationship between corporate governance and most valuation metrics. In other words, our research in academia essentially shows a positive relationship between uh, the quality of corporate governance and the value of firms. Now, there are many examples of what constitutes good corporate governance, but I've listed the most common here. First, firms whose board members are independent or not also managers of the firm are more likely to disagree with the CEO when the CEO makes a poor decision. Second, firms in which the CEO is not also the chairman of the board are said to have more effective control over management. And the reason for this should be fairly obvious. If the CEO is also the head of the organization that's supposed to oversee the CEO's actions as a manager, it's unlikely the CEO will be fired for poor performance. We also know that firms that have more frequent board meetings and greater board diversity in terms of personal backgrounds are more likely to be more valuable since there's more critical discussion during board meetings. And in other words, there's less groupthink. It's not a bunch of yes men sitting in a room. All right, now let's talk about the foreign forms of business. I realize I'm switching topics pretty rapidly, but that is the nature of our first chapter. All right, now there are a variety of ownership structures outside of the United States. One of the most common is the PLC or SA. PLCs are the British equivalent of a C corporation. These firms are publicly traded and offer their investors limited liability. SA, or as I'll poorly pronounce it here, Societe Anonyme, are corporations in countries that use civil law rather than a common law code, which is used in the US and uh, Great Britain. These firms are equivalent to a publicly traded firm in Great Britain or the United States. In addition to PLCs and SAs, there are also what are called state-owned enterprises, or SOEs. And these are firms 
where the majority shareholder or even a large minority shareholder is a, a country or the government of a country. So think China. Uh, for these firms, the goal of the firm might not necessarily be maximizing shareholder value, but rather it might be achieving some additional goal of the country that owns a stake in the company. For example, in China, many of the largest firms are considered SOEs or state-owned enterprises. Well, there is a value maximization goal or a shareholder maximization goal. These firms often employ far more people than necessary. The reason they do this is to ensure that these people have a job and an income. This goal is often at odds with the shareholder value maximization goal. The most well-known SOE out there is Saudi Aramco, which is the firm that owns the Saudi oil fields. This firm has been known to build schools and roads in Saudi Arabia, which benefits the state of Saudi Arabia. Another form of business is an industrial group. An industrial group is a broad phrase for a group of companies that are owned by one individual or a group of individuals. The most well-known examples of industrial groups are likely going to be the South Korean Chaebol. The largest Chaebol is Samsung, whose revenue is equal to approximately 17% of South Korea's GDP. Although there are various legal entities under the Samsung umbrella, the largest shareholder is the group's founding family. Finally, a multinational is any firm operating across international borders. So, for example, technically Coca-Cola is a multinational because it owns many entities in various countries. So, yes, it, it has operations in the U.S., but it'll probably have some subsidiary in uh, China, in many countries in Africa, etc. So, it it's essentially operating in certainly more than 100 countries. There are a lot of other business forums. For example, in Germany, GmbH is a common acronym after a corporation's name. I'm not going to try and pronounce what that acronym stands for, though, but most Western countries have some corporate forms similar to the C Corp or LLC, and I thought it would be a good idea to list them here. So let's recap what we covered in this chapter. First, finance is intertwined with most operations of a firm. Therefore, it's necessary for everyone studying business to have a good grasp on the basic financial techniques. Next, there are four broad areas of finance, investments, corporate finance, financial services, and financial markets. We also discussed the basic corporate forms, including sole proprietorships, partnerships, corporations, and LLCs. Next, we discussed why good corporate governance is necessary for any firm to meet its goals. In other words, there's a positive relationship between corporate governance or the quality of corporate governance and firm value. Finally, we explained why the goal of most organizations is to maximize shareholder value. Now, with that being said, I'm going to wrap up, and if you have any questions, please reach out, please contact me uh, via email, or if you want to call me, that's certainly fine. I do, I am available via Zoom, and uh, so I guess we'll, we'll end here. Thank you very much.